What's going on everyone? My name is Miles Farrington. I hope the very beginning of that did not get cut off just a little bit. But this is the Mom Podcast and this is episode 169 in the wake of E3. And I'm joined by my co-hosts... Adam Leonard. And Harry the Larry. Harry the Larry Loisides. I know that's not how you pronounce it. But that's what I'm going to go with. Close. Good enough. Yeah, good enough. All right, thank you. I, I'm sorry. I, I hate mispronouncing people's names, but I can't. I don't. I can't. My tongue doesn't work that way. Anyway, we are here to bring you another wonderful Mong podcast, and I feel like I skipped over something, but I don't think I did. So let's go ahead and go over what you've missed at the site in the since you last saw our beautiful faces, if you haven't been checking out the site. Uh, we did have a story from Darius Purse about Marvel's Spider-Man swinging to PS4 in 2018. Rocket League launches on Switch... All right, uh, holiday 2017 again by Darius Purse. Darius Purse knocking it out of the park. Uh, super hot, ready to heat up PS4 and PSVR. WWE 20K 2K18. I don't know why I said it weird. Cover superstar revealed. It's that guy. You can look it up to find out more. Uh, <laughs> Brett Williams talked about the biggest stories of E3. Darius Purse again with a Hellblade trailer uh, story, Next Machina launch trailer story, uh, Visage, which looks really awesome. If you like spoopy games, that should probably be on your list. And, of course, we had a review of The Sword, Sword, Jesus, The Surge by our very own Harry Larry. And that's what's been going on with the website thus far since last time you saw us. But if you would like to join us and write or make music or video or uh, the art or if you have other skills that you think would be awesome to join our team and help, uh, then hey, there's a link at the bottom of wherever you're watching or listening that you can click and it'll take you to an application page and you can send it in and we'll check you out and see if you can fit. You are a fit. Etc. Etc. And of course, we do have a Discord, official Discord. Go there, check it out. Uh, you can chat with us. You can leave your thoughts from nowhere there, and all that good stuff. Again, gentlemen, since it has been uh, two weeks, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna cut it down a little bit. What's been going on in your lives? Um, been playing games as usual. No surprise there. Um, been kind of uh, haven't been like super stuck on one thing. I've been just kind of like uh, playing around with some stuff. Uh, Picked up ARMS for my Switch, so I'd finally have an opportunity to get back to my Switch. And ARMS is fun. Uh, the motion controls work well. Um, the, the only the only larger problem with ARMS is ARMS is kind of light on features. Oh, so? Just like, basically, you know, basically there's matches. And, like, you know, it's basically like kind of like an old school fighting game. All you really have to do is to fight the opponent or go online and fight other people. Um, there's no real like single player mode or like kind of extra stuff to do. So it's very cut and dry. Yeah, I, I would say that's correct. Um, and as opposed to like let's say, uh, as opposed to God, why can't I think of the name of like their like Nintendo shooter game with the squids? Oh, uh, Splatoon. Splatoon. So the tune felt like it was a little more fleshed out, like there was a little more to do if you weren't just like interested in just having a match after match after match. But ARMS is fun. Uh, so I've been playing ARMS, and I also spent some time playing around on Switch in a game that uh, Miles is very familiar with, uh, Binding of Isaac. Yes, such a good game. Really fun game. I really enjoy it because it is like it's got such a dark sense of humor, and you're like poor guy just becomes more and more messed up. Like the deeper you go, like the more upgrades you get, and um, and so that's a lot of fun. Um, so I haven't got all the way to the bottom yet, but it's you know it's a neat game. You know, obviously, obviously it's got its you know roots in Zelda, yeah. and it's good. And then finally, I've just been playing um, a bunch of Dark Souls three because I'm finally setting out to. Uh, do the DLC so I can kind of put the game to bed for you know probably a long time. So I'm on I'm on the f I'm just about done with the first DLC and then I'm going to be moving on to the second one. Okay. So in in all the games that you've been kind of cycling through this last time we talked, what's been your favorite? What's been the the shining star right now? It's Dark Souls. It's always going to be that's going to be kind of the answer. Um, though this playthrough's gone a lot quicker. It feels like. It feels like it's kind of crazy that um, that how much it, it's crazy and scary sometimes how much like memory space video games can take it will take up in your head sometimes because like Dark Souls Three is like a pretty large game and I'm playing through it again I found that 
I know the ins and outs of large chunks of that game. Like, like you know, large areas. Like, I just kind of know where everything is. And that's kind of frightening. I mean, I guess you could kind of say muscle memory. I know it's not the exact same thing, but it's just like, <laughs> you do it enough, you kind of just kind of, you know where you're going. It's like, that was like me with Destiny. Just someone asks where something is, I can just... Oh yeah, it's 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 even if it's like in the butt crack of everything else on the map, it's like I know where it is. So, um, yeah, and lastly, uh, I've been also watching some TV. Um, I've got a recommendation, like a Netflix recommendation. I started to check out last weekend the TV show Glow, which just came out, and then basically like three sitting sessions later, I like watched all ten episodes. It's really really fantastic. Um, for anybody who doesn't know what Glow is, Glow is a comedy um, done by the same guy Orange is a New Black. And basically it's uh, Alison Brie from like Community and Mad Men plays like uh, kind of like a failed actress in the 80s. And due to not getting any roles, she winds up taking a job as a female professional wrestler in an all-female company. And it's just basically about like this professional wrestling company coming together and it's really great it's got a great ensemble cast it's really funny it's poignant at parts and perhaps most surprisingly it has like a real appreciation for professional wrestling and actually does a pretty good job of you know taking somebody who probably would know nothing about the sport and kind of kind of explaining it to them in a way that they can understand so if you have, so I definitely recommend it. It's a great show, a lot of fun. It's only like ten episodes, so it's you know maybe like a five hour commitment, really. Yeah. Yeah, I actually just finished watching it today, and I agree with everything Adam just said. A lot of fun, really good. I was expecting it to be a half ass kind of '80s trope show, but it's actually really enjoyable to watch, and there's a lot of good storytelling with it. Uh, yeah, and it's also really anchored by like three really strong performances. Uh, Alison Brie is great. Um, she kind of makes the lead character not entirely likable, but you do kind of root for her. Um, it just kind of it's kind of like paints her with a shade of gray. Um, there's Debbie Gilpin as like kind of her jaded or her kind of like ex best friend. Um, she's really great, and Mark Maron was kind of was outstanding as kind of like the promoter of this company. Yeah, I've heard really good things. I. I will watch it after I watch Preacher and American Gods and Steven Universe and all the other things that have been growing in my docket of TV shows I need to pick up and go through. Just finished, nice. Ameri- I finished up American Gods season finale. It's like, oh my god. It's amazing. Um, and I've watched the first two, I can watch the first two episodes of the second season of Preacher and it's just getting, as as you would hope Preacher would, it's just getting more and more like violent and deranged and like incredibly darkly funny and it's good stuff. The first episode was pretty violent so I would, that, that's extreme. <laughs> well yeah, that's just, that sounds like a fun two weeks. What about you Harry, what's been going on in your world? Uh, Well, we just finished the school year, so I am officially on summer vacation, so that is glorious. Um, So in that time, I've slept way more than I used to, so that's a wonderful feeling. But when I'm awake, um, I've been playing Breath of the Wild still, getting ready for the DLC to come out on Friday. I've also been playing some Rocket League on PS4, getting ready for the holiday 2017, like you mentioned, when it comes out on Switch. Um, For some reason, I'm in a Destiny mode. I think I talked about that last time. So I've been enjoying some grinding for a game I haven't played in a while. And then right now, I'm playing Rhyme for the first time. And it's a good game. Um, I think I liked it a lot when I started. It was very cutesy wootsy with the cell shading and the the non dialogue storytelling. But it's kind of I'm probably two thirds of the way there, and it's probably getting a little stale. So hopefully it picks up for the last little bit. Okay. Well, yeah. So. Did you suggest it to other people? I have a friend who actually is like really interested in it. Um, if it's for forty dollars, I would say maybe. Um, I would wait for a price drop, I think. Yeah, but, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's drastically emotionally of an ending, and I'm super hyped for it. And then I said, you definitely got to check this out. But there's definitely some issues with gameplay. Like, the puzzles are good. They're enjoyable. 
but a lot of them are very like basic and not super exciting. So yeah, I don't want to get too much into and hype people out of it, but I think it's a good game, and if you like that art style and direction and not too crazy of a gameplay, then it could be a fun experience for you. Nice, very nice. I'll have to, I'll have to uh, not refer. I don't know what the word is, but give relay, that, relay. Thank you, relay that uh, right. that information over to my friend. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I've been doing is pretty much I I buried the hatchet with Overwatch. Uh, a couple of friends invited me to play it one night, and I was like, "All right, I'll I'll play." And it was like, "Oh, I'm not a potato anymore, so this is actually kind of fun." Um, I think I just turned my sensitivity up, and I was able to actually kill people, so that's probably why I'm enjoying it now. Um, so I, I've been playing a lot of Overwatch actually. Uh, was playing a bit of Destiny uh, with one of the friends, but we kind of moved on from that and. I bought some stuff on Steam Summer Sale, so I'm excited to get into that stuff. Uh, so far, I've gotten Shadow of Mordor, like, grand big collector's edition. Or nice. Game of the year. Yeah. When I saw it was $5.99, I was like, oh, I kind of want to play the next one. So I was like, yeah, I guess I should get it. Um, picked up Genital Jousting, which I have not played yet, but I bought that because <laughs> I wanted to play it. Um, picked up uh, Battle Block Theater, which I have extensive experience in, but I really enjoy that. And again, someone wants to play it so I can play with them. And, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about picking up the Wolfenstein and Doom and, uh, maybe, uh, what's that other one? Uh, Dead Cells. I, I'm kind of curious about getting, but yeah, I'm buying a lot more games than I should because I don't have time to play them for the most part. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like the problem about, like, uh, adulting. Yeah. Well, that, and I was going to say, and like Steam and Steam sales is that you always inevitably bind up buying way more stuff than you're ever, ever, ever going to play. And so you just have like all these random things you picked up because they were marked down and you thought you might like to play them at some point. Now, if I ever get rich on Bitcoin, then, then I will have all the time I need to play. Uh, but yeah, no. Uh, I, I've had this conversation multiple times in like the past month, I think, where it's just like, that horrible balance, or hey, I got all the money I need, and I have no time to eat, play my games. Sorry, there's like a gnat in my room that's killing me. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and then if you have all the time in the world to play your games, you don't have any money to buy any new ones. So that's the the vicious cycle that gamerism is in. Um, yeah. Well, and it goes beyond just time, though. I, I think it's also a matter of like, as a gamer, and maybe you're different, like. It's like I have to be in the mood for something, and so there's games that I've purchased at one point because I, maybe at that point I'm like, oh, maybe I'll be in the mood someday to play this game, and then I just never find myself wanting to play this game. Like, I'll be like, I've got free time, I could play the Borderlands prequel, but there's something else I'd rather be playing. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's usually like, I I will get a bunch of games, like, usually it's with PS4 just because, you know, I get like three games coming in a month, and then I download them, and then they sit there for a while, and then like every now and then I'll have one night where I'll be like, okay, I'm going to play you know, the first 30 minutes of this game, and I'm going to judge it with extreme prejudice. And if I enjoy it enough where I want to keep playing it, I'll keep playing it. Like, that's why I ended up uh, beating Steam World Dig. Because I that was like, I, yeah, it was one of the games that just been sitting there. I was like, all right, I'm going to play it. Played it for 30 minutes. I was like, this is actually really fun. So I kept playing it. Um, yes. and, yeah, and of course, a lot of games fall by the wayside. And... I don't know. I feel like it's that law where it's, um, you know, if was it X amount of minutes or X, like for books and movies and stuff or TV series, you have to give it like X amount of uh, pages, episodes, etc. And then if you're not enjoying it, you should probably just go ahead and cut your loss and give up on it. And I know that doesn't always stand true because some like movies are slow burns and some series are like, hey, it takes a while to ramp up. Like Daredevil season one. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's how I've been. Well, there's it. like, there's some TV shows I think that even take like, like, you can almost like discard a season. Like shows, like just off the top of my head, like Parks and Recreation and Sons of Anarchy are both shows, are both like, are like both like TV shows that I would say like if you're not digging the first season, you almost just need to get to the second season where to where it actually gets good. Yeah, like Agents of Shield, where they they were kind of yeah. hampered for the first season because yeah, uh, the first half was a. Com- 
it was a complete bore fest and yeah. you're just like what is the point of this until the whole hydra thing happened you're like all right this is instantly amazing now and yeah. everything after that was stellar but anyway gentlemen let's go ahead and move on to our favorite segment the news from nowhere Perfect timing. So, the first story... I don't know why I have this window up. The first story this week comes to us... Uh, I, I don't know. I, ugh, it, it's an Anthem story, because I'm going to become the Anthem guy at this point. So, the tone of Anthem story will be very much like Star Wars, says Bioware. Uh, though we only know a few details about Bioware's upcoming shooter RPG Anthem. Uh, oh, also uh, writer of Mass Effect 1 and 2, the lead writer, Drew Carpishan. Carpishan? Yeah. Is uh, working on it, so that's neat. Uh... And we at least know it's a sci-fi game. What we didn't know, however, was what kind of sci-fi it is. In a recent interview with Canada's CBC News, Bioware Edmonton General Manager Aaron Flynn mentioned that the game would be a science fantasy game, leaning away from the harder sci-fi of Mass Effect and more into the fantastical tone of other sci-fi stories. According to Flynn, the, an the Anthem, Anthem, I don't know why they put a V in there, uh, is very much like Star Wars. Very much like the Marvel Universe, where you see a lot of amazing things happening. Uh, Mass Effect is more our real hardcore science fiction IP, uh, Flynn said. This one is much more just about having fun in a game world that is lush and exotic and really sucks you in. And Flynn also said much of the game's inspiration comes from the people who made it. We've had folks who have moved into Canada who are immigrants, and so often those stories find their way in, Flynn said. We have LGBTQ members, and those stories make their way into the game. At this point, I would not expect a Bioware game to not have some kind of LGBTQ uh, aspect. Not that, That's not a bad thing, by the way. For any haters. No. Um, that's not a bad thing. But, uh, yeah, I like it. Uh, I like mixing realms a bit. And Star Wars Extended Universe is really interesting and cool to watch and all that. So, I'm alright with it. Yeah, it sounds very cool. I'm hoping that we're not going to have a product of overhypeness that we're expecting a 12 out of 10 game, and then it turns out to be a great game, and then people are immediately disappointed. So I'm keeping my expectations totally at meh territory until I, I see a little bit more. I mean, it's cool. Like, I love Star Wars, and if you tell any, if you ask anyone, like, you say Star Wars, you instantly have my attention. So when I read this, too, I was like, huh. This sounds super cool, but then I had to pull myself back and say, wait a minute, I don't want this to be like a scenario where I'm like, oh, there's going to be a Death Star thing, there's going to be some sort of lightsaber thing, there's going to be some sort of Oedipus complex or Macbeth scenario, so I'm just kind of pulling back. Probably good that you don't expect the Oedipus complex, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, let's hope, let's hope we don't have any experience drama right now. It kind of sounds like this. Like they, they issued out this story to shut up the Mass Effect fans who are complaining about them trying to replace Mass Effect with another sci-fi game. Yeah, that, that could definitely be the truth. Just cause there's probably a lot of people that are really salty about how Mass Effect Three went over, and they're like, "Oh, now you're, we're just never going to Mass Effect again." And it's like that's not the point. Calm down. Shut up. Sit down. Well, they did also say they're they're they are putting that on hold right now. Mass Effect Andromeda sequel. So. Maybe maybe their long-term game plan is to have a Mass Effect game parallel to an Anthem game, and then a couple years later, another Mass Effect game, and then a couple years later, Anthem. Like, they go back and forth. Yeah, I can see so. that. That may be, they may be able to do that, but I am also a little bit skeptical, because I think it's, it's ambitious and very difficult for a company to try to market two separate sci-fi games. That's true. That, that's also a good point. I like both points, but they're both very valid. Um, I guess only time will tell what they're going to actually decide to do with Mass Effect. I highly doubt that it's gone, but, uh, you know, it it couldn't hurt to take a little break. Because uh, we don't want it to become, you know, well, for some people, you know, we don't want, to, want people to get burnt out like Call of Duty and Assassin's Creed and other games that come out yearly, by yearly etc., so... I know Mass Effect doesn't come out yearly, but you see my, I hope people understand my point. I understand your point. Thumbs Thanks. up to... <laughs> so, anything else y'all want to say about Anthem? The game that we don't actually know all that much about still? No, looks pretty. Yeah. Moderately excited. We'll be more excited whenever we get a window of release date. 
Yeah, most definitely. I uh, I just wanted to be at least Destiny. That's that's my hope. Doesn't even the have Destiny. To be like... Go ahead. I hope it's the Destiny that we were promised with a cool story, good gameplay, and I think like what we saw with Destiny Two, it's kind of remedy in that same way with the DLC expansion packs. But I'm hoping that it kind of blends in that awesome gameplay with the group game, gameplay mechanics with also a decent story that you can actually give a shit about, give a hoot about. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'll be honestly, I, I would, since I fell in love with Destiny in year one, like beginning of year one when it was bad, uh, I would be all right with, you know, I'd, of course I don't want it to come out and have those problems, but I'd be all right with that. But enough about Anthem. Let's move on to our next story of the night, the one that is super and classic. So, guys, remember how, like, last year, like, Nintendo released, like, the Nintendo Classic, which was, like, a, like, a for you know, like, basically a, like, Nintendo-looking thing that had a bunch of NES games? I remember how it was, like, super, super popular and everybody wanted one, but they made too few. Mm-hmm. And so not everybody got them, and a bunch of scalpers bought most of them, and they like, are charging like four times the amount. And instead of like you know keep on printing that money, they just decided to discontinue it out of nowhere. So like all those people who wanted one no longer get to have one. So what do you think Nintendo would do next per se? Uh, Make a new one with even less. No, no, I believe I believe they said that they said that this wouldn't be a problem, right? They they mm-hmm. claimed that they were gonna print enough, didn't they? <laughs> So, this week, Nintendo announced a Super Nintendo Classic Edition, which is basically the same thing as the NES one, except it is now, like, a little tiny Super Nintendo that plugs into your TV, and it comes with 21 games, most notably the never-before-released Star Fox 2. Now, Nintendo is claiming that they have... Nintendo has claimed that they have fixed several problems going forward. One, they're saying that they're going to have longer controller cords, so from what I've read, they haven't specified how long those controller cords are going to be. And two, <laughs> they're claiming that they're going to produce significantly more units of this this time. Um, like, my literal first reaction uh, when I like heard about this, I'm like, great! I'm really looking forward to never being able to find one of these. Yeah. You, oh. you know where they're already sold out on? Everywhere? Yep. <laughs> yeah. The UK it's sold out, Germany sold out, France is sold out. Um, I guess we're just waiting to see when it's going to go on pre-order, in air quotes, if that's actually happening in the States, and when that's going to be sold out. Uh, but they did out. say, and I thought it was really funny, like like Adam said, that they're going to make significantly more. But then they also mentioned in the press release that they're going to discontinue it at the end of the year. So I'm just like, what are you doing, Nintendo? You know this is going to be a cash cow. And they kind of like backhandedly said that they want to have the focus be on the Switch. Which is, you know, makes sense. This is the, that's the $300 device. But this is such another easy cash grab that, you know, someone's going to buy this and a Switch. Someone's not going to just only buy this. I find them very unlikely. And even if they do, that's more money to the company that you can then dump back into the Switch account. But, but Harry, what are you talking about? These are $300. Because when the scalpers have all of them and are selling them, they're going to sell them for $300. <laughs> yeah, um, but if you're dumb enough to buy it for $300, you're making a poor decision in your life. You could probably buy a real SNES for less than that. But then so. you'll have reasonable controller cord lengths. <laughs> yeah, but you already have reasonable control length on the actual one. It's not like a, oh, that's what I'm saying. a little silly. Oh. So, first then first, we agree. Yep. I do kind of yeah. want one of these because, like, if you look at the 21 games, it's like one hell of a lineup yeah. of stuff to have. Um, but yeah, it is frustrating because I would like one of these. Um, I don't think I'm ever going to get one of these. You know what particularly kind of pisses me off are the people on, like, you know, the various video game forums and Facebook groups that are totally, totally trying to justify their scalping. Um, and they'll be like, well, you know, I, you know, it's technically it's Nintendo's fault because they're not making enough of them. And if people are going to pay you for time yeah. for it, no. you know, that's just like, you know, common business practices. It's like, well, OK, what you're saying, you're you're basically trying to grab the moral high ground by saying stuff that is technically true. You're still a fucking asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely true. Uh, scalping is yeah. not cool regardless of what your reasoning is. And in the grand scheme of things, let's just say. That you wait online for ten hours to get two SNESs, and instead of buying it for eighty bucks, you sell it for someone for like two hundred and fifty. 
is your time of that 10 hours really worth the difference of those two amounts? Probably not. And if it is, you need to reevaluate your life. But, you know, that's none of my business as I drink the Kermit meme of tea. Because um, <laughs> that just doesn't make sense to me. Like, even if you sell it for a $170 or $180, you're really only making $10 per hour in that situation. So that's just a total, you're better off not wasting your time and just getting an actual job that will reward you more than just that minuscule amount to frustrate another fan. It's really funny. Like, uh, I won't go like too into depth simply because I probably shouldn't call anybody or anything, but I'll specifically, but a, a really well known group of people who have like several different podcasts. Um, their lead guy was on one of the shows talking about kind of basically kind of discouraging people from the whole scalping practice. And Are there was actually, somewhat funny. They might be. And there was actually a thread of people in their like Facebook group that was actually like upset that they would try to discourage people from scalping. Like, it was just, like, an entire thread dedicated to trying to pat themselves on the back that what they're doing is perfectly fine. And how dare, like, you know, how dare this person, you know, think that's not a cool practice. I mean, yeah, there's nothing illegal about it. There's nothing, like, fiscally wrong with it. It's technically fiscally smart. But you have no moral high ground. I think if you're gonna if you're going to scalp, don't try and defend it. Yeah, well, you know what? Quietly. It's also technically legal to go to go protest at like a gay soldier's funeral, but should exactly. you do it? Fuck no. Exactly. Oh, Westboro. Well, I think scalpers are a little bit, a little, a few steps above Westboro Baptist Church, but I, uh, maybe a half a step. Uh, uh, maybe modern Westboro Baptist Church. They're they're still horrible people, but they're starting to change a little bit. Uh. <laughs> So yes, Super Nintendo Classic Edition and Westboro Baptist Church. That's what this episode's about. <laughs> That's where we've gone. And just to kind of bring us back, I do think it's worth knowing this is $10 more expensive for a third less games, which I thought was interesting. Um, neither here nor there. I, I think that there's a lot of great games, but it's just interesting that they are slowly increasing the price of these on the MSRB side. So maybe if they do a and 64 instead of it being 70 or 80 dollars it know. might be wait it went well, no it's 20 dollars more expensive right oh. wasn't the first one 59.99 in like perfect land where it's no scalping now it's 79.99 so it's actually 20 oh that's even more proof of my point that next one's probably going to be 100 dollars for an n64 classic which sounds kind of obnoxious so are we going to catch up and we'll have a switch classic while the switch is still alive <laughs> Ah, uh, there's no way. I think they're going to stop at N64, unless there's really no virtual council for Switch, or there's going to be a really shitty one, and they're just going <laughs> to pop these out. The there's going to be good. No, nah, I love like GameCube. That was my there's there's going to be like the Wii U Classic. It's going to have like four games. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Because then what? If they if they shell out one every year, this year is the SNES. Year after is N64. Year after that's GameCube. Then we, then we, you. That's four more years after this year that they can milk this. Yep. Or now, if they want to do it after, like every other year after this year or something stupid like that. Or not including the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Advance, yeah, the Game Boy so Micro. Dumb. Like, I'm sure they can certainly milk this, uh, this classic edition marketing. Now, I, I won't be as critical for them over the price range. Just even though, even though it's the less games, just like looking. Looking kind of at a glance, like let me just highlight a couple titles for you: Final Fantasy III, Earthbound, Secret of Mana, Mario RPG, and uh, A Link to the Past. Those are all very beefy games. Like those are like long games. I mean, honestly, Super Ghouls and God or Ghouls and Ghosts. I mean, you're gonna be playing that forever because you won't be able to beat it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, this is a really good offering, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, but we're never going to see it, so why should we worry about it? I guess I'm well, good. I, I mean, I got the NES Classic, and I was very fortunate without, like, you know, selling my soul and my next future children. So there is a chance that you guys can snag it. Oh, I, don't so I am currently looking up Super Nintendo Classic on eBay. That's oh, yeah, it's ridiculous. Money. People are already guaranteeing 
slots, even though they haven't gone on sale in the U.S. yet. So that's disappointing to see. Yeah, I mean, I'm immune to this because I don't care about this. I I respect old games, but I don't want to play them. I've come to that realization. <laughs> See, like, this is stuff that makes me mad, is I'm looking on eBay, and I came across a, a, um, a, you know, a, a auction for, like, a Nintendo Classic, which is selling for almost $300, and this dude for the picture for this is, like, his living room, and he's got, like, 30 Nintendo Classics yep. just, like, py pyramided up. Yep. Shinobi, uh, on Twitter, well, if I'd said the rest of the Shinobi tweeted that picture out, or... I think it was Shinobi, and he was like, you know, remember people, you won't be able to get your hands on this because of people like this. Yeah, I guess these people need bag. to see these people need to see some kind of karmaic retribution, that's for sure. They all just burn. <sighs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed that they burn? Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> whatever. You're on summer break, go burn them, Harry. Oh yes, I'll burn them with my Anger towards education right now. <laughs> there you go. But you know who else is angry towards education? And I don't know if this is a factual statement, so don't take it by, to heart. That's the best segue you're getting, Harry. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I was like, he's definitely not going to transition to me right now. Um, so, yeah, the thing that I wanted to touch on was... The weekend after E3, the Nintendo Store in New York had this really cool uh, couple days where they demoed and allowed fans to demo various games that were shown at E3. So I was able to demo Super Mario Odyssey. I was able to demo Fire Emblem Heroes and then Pokémon Torment DX. And all three of them were awesome. So I'm just going to quickly run down my thoughts on them. Um, and a pre-knowledge, I never played any of them. I never played a Pokken tournament on the Wii U. I never played a Hero... Uh, ooh, Fire Emblem... I meant Warriors. Ooh, no one corrected me. Um, which is like the hack and slash game. And then I'd never played Super Mario Odyssey for obvious reasons. So Super Mario Odyssey, super fun. It's pretty much a mix of Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Sunshine's gameplay where you're in a, a large world and you're just kind of exploring... Uh, I was able to play New Donk City, and the name I, is escaping me right now, but it's like uh, the Day of the Dead slash Red Sand world where mm -hmm. Mario can explore. Tons of fun. You can. It's very easy to get the mechanics ready. Uh, you running, jumping, doing the triple jumps, um, jumping on side to side. It's a lot, it was very interesting. And the possession, I, I forgot the the Nintendo friendly phrase, but the, essentially when you throw Cappy, the, the eyed hat, mm -hmm. you're able to possess characters and just play as them, which was a lot of fun. And I'm very excited to see the full version of this. So you can totally explore in ways that we've never actually played a Mario game before, which seems really interesting and that they're keep pushing the ideas and not making train wrecks with Mario, which is very nice. Um, I don't want to harp on that too much because I'm sure we've already like exhausted the plethora of ideas with that. But Fire Emblem Warriors, I'm surprised I haven't seen more on because it is crazy fun. I have no idea how to play most of the Warriors games. It's kind of it's pretty much a hack and slash where you fight dozens upon dozens of enemies. Um, and happily, this doesn't cause any janking or frame rate issues, which I was really afraid of, especially with. Uh, the Switch is limited, not limited, but less than powerful capabilities compared to other systems. You're able to hack and slash like 40 enemies at once. You're able to do a lot of power moves, a lot of mixed attacks. And it kind of blends all the characters from uh, Fire Emblem's Birthright, Awakening, and prior games before that in a fun and cool way where, you know, the hack and slash is very basic and anyone can pick it up and play but the fine details with it was a lot of fun and trying to master combos trying to master power moves was a lot of a lot very cool and then pocket torment dx i thought was surprisingly awesome i kind of just rolled my eyes when i saw pocket a couple maybe two years ago when it came out on wii u and i was like all right i'm not gonna play this i'm not a fighting game guy other than smash but this was a really easy way to pick up there's a lot of power moves similar to 
like boosts where you know a Pokemon can help you battle the Pokemon you're going against, or you can hit combos, you can do environmental things. It, it was really nice, and I'm I think those three <sighs> games, whenever they come out, I think Mario's October, Pokemon Tournament September, and Fire Emblems is whenever. I think they said holiday. It's going to be a nice powerhouse for the end of year for a Switch, which is nice because I'm happy that the Switch is doing so well and that people are enjoying it so much. <laughs> Do we have any questions? I kind of like plowed through all those. Um, Mario Odyssey is high up on my list of things to play in the reigning year. Yeah. I agree. Mario Odyssey is one of the games that I would definitely pick up if I were to buy a Switch. And I'm probably not going to. Well, but the Pokemons are going to come out, Miles. That was like your dream. Uh, when Pokemon they games, yes. When they release that one, or when they reveal that one that's like a new one and isn't Sun and Moon, I'll, I'll, that's when I'll think about it. I don't want to play a re-release. I haven't played any of them yet. I'm not going to play them in the future. Um, but yeah, that's good. It, that's an awesome uh, little it, it, event, I guess, to like you know let you experience E3 if you've never been or if you experience a facet of E3 if you've never been or if you can't afford to go or whatever. That's that's really yeah. Cool. And they've been doing this for a few years. So, like, when uh, F-Zero came out, not F-Zero, Firefox came out, when Yoshi Woolly Ward came out, a few other games, like Super Mario Maker, especially when it was uh, versioning. It was a lot of fun to play them right at the cusp of when they were released and to see a lot of fans get excited and to see the store do such a good job of, like, crowd control was really nice and pleasantly surprised because a lot of their events are hit and miss either they're going to be perfectly assembled or they're going to be train wrecks so yeah. this was a good one i do have a couple questions and first of all the nintendo store is awesome when i was in visiting my friend last october in new york i went and that place is a amazing hello hello yeah so harry higher electronics and entertainment divisions what is happening I can't edit this out. <laughs> I think Harry's been sucked into the upside down world from Stranger Things. Keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, have you ever been to the Nintendo store, Miles? Uh, I've never been to New York, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's neat. There's like lots of Nintendo swag, and um, yeah, I was really glad I went. This is unfortunate because the whole reason I was talking is that I was going to ask Harry some questions about the event. Um, but Harry is apparently dead. I think he lost audio for the podcast or something, so hopefully he'll get back in here soon. Um, but looking at um, time. You have, you have something else you want to say? No. Uh, let's go ahead and jump onto the... Yeah, the, the double shot. Let's try to jump onto the thought of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so... Hello? Can you hear us now? <laughs> well, what's going on? Uh. Can, can you hear us? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus? Yep, Jesus. I'm blaming him for all of this. You hear that, Jesus? Anywho, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and jump to the Thought from yeah, Nowhere. Yeah, let's, let's go for the um, Thought from Nowhere. Yeah, why don't we? So this week's Thought from Nowhere comes to us from our long-lost Chris the Corn Man Cobb, uh, and it's what 80s action movie slash franchise would do, ugh, most deserves a big budget game a la Alien Isolation. Example, Terminator, FES taking place during 1 and 2, alternating between past and future, switching characters with John Connor, Kyle Reese, and finally the good uh, T-800. I may have had several dreams about this. That is actually a pretty good suggestion. But anyway, that's what we're going with this week. So, Adam, I know that you have a, a few ideas. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the first one is, I think it'd be really awesome if Volition, that's the studio that's responsible for the Saints Row games, yeah. made a video game based on Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, I've never actually seen that movie, so that'd be a weird introduction, you've, but... You've never seen that movie? That movie, it's... Like, okay, so there, this is why I want the Saints Row guys to do it, because... Um, you know, disregard the first couple of Saint Rose games. I think where Saint Ro Saints Row kind of really caught its groove is when it decided to stop yeah. fully being like a Grand Theft Auto clone and just kind of embrace its own weirdness. 
And I think they'd be perfect for with Big Trouble in Little China is basically Kurt Russell plays this truck driver, and he his truck basically gets stolen, and th- while trying to get his truck back, he gets like basically sucked up into the world of like Chinese gods, and all of a sudden he's having to deal with like all these like ancient Chinese forces and stuff. But he's still like Kurt Russell; he's just completely blur 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 belligerent. It just does not understand what's going on around him, <laughs> and so he just kind of he just tries to swagger his way through the world, like the world of Chinese, uh, you know, like Chinese mysticism. And it's an absolutely hilariously overblown, over the top movie. And I think that the Saints Row guys could probably do that justice. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Actually, I've, I never actually knew what that movie was about. I just I've always seen the cover, and I've been like. This looks odd. I'm not gonna watch it. <laughs> you you really should watch it. It's like a real like it's a real fun film. I'll have to check it out at some point. Um, I guess I'll take. Uh, honestly, I'm looking at a list of things because I was not born in the '80s. Fun fact. Uh, so you know, I I admit I'm not wholly connected to that era. But a lot of these movies have actually been made already. Um, however, I think it would be crazy for someone to decide to take. E.T. And I know there's been a game made already, but I want someone <laughs> to make E.T. actually good. And now I don't know if that's like a sequel that's like E.T. with guns or if it's like a walking simulator where you just walk around a city saying E.T. phone home poking people <laughs> with your glowing finger or I don't know, but <laughs> I, I want to... Back- <laughs> No, we're not going it back. It sounds like you're eliciting. <laughs> no, 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 you're going back. Go back to the part with E.T. with guns. Oh, okay, that point, okay. Yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, like, Hollywood... is E.T. the one with the guns? Yeah, yeah. It would be <laughs> like what they did with uh, Tarzan most recently, where they, like, took the regular Tarzan, where it's like, oh, that's kind of funny and cute and everything. And they're like, we're making it gritty and hardcore. He's going to beat apes with his bare hands and that nonsense. So that's what I want to happen with E.T. <laughs> So then, like, is then Spielberg going to eventually remaster the game so that E.T.'s guns are replaced with walkie-talkies? No, that's the no. G-rated version. Because that's what totally would happen to E.T. I know. I don't want that to happen, though. Oh, so they just released the real thing. Where you got like, shoot down the FBI agents who are coming to take you. Et cetera, et cetera. It's like E.T.'s revenge. Exactly. E.T.'s coming for you. <laughs> Instead of X, go give it to you. It's E.T., go give it to you. (laughs) Oh, there we go. (laughs) He eats Reese's Pieces for his health. Yes. And his best move is he just, like, pokes somebody with a glowing finger and they just explode. There we go. I've made a game for you, somebody. E.T. Pone Home. Oh, okay. E.T. Hold him up. (laughs) It's just, like, the cover art is just him with two... Two fingers in the air, just glowing. It's just like, he's back. <laughs> yeah. E.T. is gonna call the morgue. <laughs> E.T. phone the morgue. <laughs> oh, God, this is awful. And we should... All right, go ahead. What, what you got, uh, Harry, now that you're back with us? <laughs> yes, I don't know what happened. That was my bad. Um, but I definitely think it would be cool if someone made a game based on the Who Framed Roger Rabbit world that would be super cool very unrealistic with all the license scenes in the game but i think having like a mix of super surreal people and cartoon characters can be a lot of fun whether it's a action game whether it's a jrpg whether it's a mystery game especially with the the who framed roger rabbit like that's pretty much self-explanatory in the title like i think that could be really cool and it was born. It was made before I was born, so I, like I remember seeing it as a kid, like five or six years out, and being both amazed and horrified at the same time for certain points. So I think they could do the same thing with this, where they there's a lot of cutesy wootsy stuff, but then every once in a while there'd be a super super gory or super super unsettling aspect to it. And I, don't okay. know, I think that'd be super fun. Can I pitch to you, Harry? Go for it. This needs to be made by Rockstar. Mm-hmm. This needs to be like a GTA style game. Open world, New York on one side, two town on the other. Oh, I love it. Oh, wow, that driving around really that, driving around in that taxi. Yeah, that'd be perfect. So, or cool. GTA Six with an expansion. 
that would be really cool too if that was just the expansion. It's like surprise, we're using our engine to make Roger Rabbit. That'd be amazing. All right, like that would, amazing. that would be incredible. Even if they can't get all the characters, if they get enough, like his wife, like the voluptuous redhead lady, I forgot her name. Uh, but I think. Oh, oh, that's super easy. I should have known that. But <laughs> yeah, I think if they do something like that, it'd be a smash hit. Even if people didn't know it what the characters were, they'd be like, oh, this is such a weird juxtaposition with super surreal and super whimsical. I think it could get a lot of interest and buzz going. Honestly, like, I could see that being, like, really cool, just like how GTA games have been recently, where you have multiple characters and everything. You know, you could, like, toss in... I mean, that would be a very interesting dynamic of, like, playing Eddie Valiant going into Toon Titty, or playing uh, Roger Rabbit going into the Human City. That would be neat. Just... Did you say Toon Titty? I said Toon City. <laughs> That's definitely not what I heard. All right, well, well, we definitely know what's on Adam's head right now. We know what's on your mind. But um, yeah. we're going to toss out one more. Uh, for me, anyway. Um, I just realized uh, Evil Dead is on this list of movies that came out in the 80s. And uh, I really like Evil Dead, personally. Um, so, yeah. I... I think that would be a neat game. I don't want to play it, but I want to watch somebody else play it. Uh, <laughs> you know, you should uh, check out YouTube or Twitch. There actually have been a couple Evil Dead games. Really now? Yeah. Uh huh. If I remember right, they weren't half bad either. Oh, I will have to check. Which that is out. a good thing. Yeah. Was never mind. I'm not going to ask that question. That's that's inappropriate. Do it. I guess. Nope. Um, no, do it. Do it. No, there's no tree. That's probably what you're thinking about, right? Yep, that's what no. I was thinking about. <laughs> there's no tree. Okay. Um, oh, and one more, which I think is very unrealistic, but could be super fun. If they have some sort of storytelling version of Spaceballs, I think that would be hilarious. That would be funny. It would be like, a, like Guardians of the Galaxy or uh, the Tales from the Borderlands series. Yeah, I think it would be so silly that it could work especially for like the whole resurgence of star wars that a star wars spoof video game could be amazing same thing with like the stick of truth and uh fractured butthole for south park where they're spoofing and real things this could be another spoof on star wars i think it could actually really work as a telltale game i don't think it's that like wild or far off i mean if they could do like back to the future they could probably get away with doing like space balls yeah yeah I, we are giving developers <laughs> ideas right now. Remember, developers, if you liked our ideas, you can contact us, contact us at contact.mog at gmail.com because we have more of them, I swear. Um, yeah. I, all right, here's another one. And this was kind of like a little bit of a gimme, but I still think this would be cool. Is it'd be cool to see the Ubisoft team behind Far Cry and Blood Dragon make a Escape from New York video game? Ooh, so good. good. Uh, yeah. What's well, the storyline is essentially the title. So in case, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. No. And one, I'm gonna sneak in another one. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I think that would be really funny if you play half the game as the parents and half the game as the kids. That could be really cool. Yeah. That'd be a really so, cool dynamic. Yes, it would. What are you about to say, Adam? I was going to say, so does anybody have, like, a video game based on an 80s franchise that's their, like, favorites? Um, point out, like, my favorite, like, you know, my the example that jumped to my head, the reason I asked this, is I don't know if either of you guys played the Ghostbusters game from last generation. I did not. It was pretty friggin' amazing. It was exactly what you wanted. It was um, basically kind of a sequel to the movies. It brought back the original cast to voice it. And it was exactly what you wanted a Ghostbusters game to be. You were in, like, you know, wandering through, like, spoopy locations and, like, shooting the ghosts with, like, the packs and, like, putting them in the traps. And you got to fight, like, Slimer and you got to fight, like, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. It was pretty friggin' rad. I'm gonna that go sounds phenomenal. Me. My pick would be just Friday the 13th because it's the only thing on this list that I'm really thinking of that I've spent enough time watching and or playing. Watching. Uh, so, yeah, I enjoy watching people play Friday the 13th. It's not really because of the, the movie series itself, though. It's just because people are funny when they play it. <laughs> Sorry, were you were you saying only '80s movies, or were you just saying movies in general? Uh, if you want to, if you want to deviate, I'll I'll allow it. I mean, I guess I could do a backdoor thing and say Lego Star Wars because one of those movies came out in '81. 
Oh, that's 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 totally a fair answer. Um, but I can't really think of anything phenomenal right now because Jurassic Park was the nineties. Um, I can't think of anything else right now. Alien, I think, was really cool. I think that came in, that that was definitely eighties. Uh, honorable mention to the Back to the Future Telltale game that was kind of rad. Yeah, I, that was that is a perfect example of what we talked about in the beginning of the show, where we buy things on super sale and then never play them. So I have that on my PS4, just eventually waiting to be played. Okay. Well, gentlemen, I think that that was a productive thought from nowhere. How do you? Oh, Mad you... Max. Oh uh, yeah. Sorry. What, was that actually the eighties? Pretty sure. Uh, maybe. Um, I think if I could be wrong, I want to say Mad Max was late seventies. Road Warrior was probably eighties. I'm, I'm gonna, oh. I'm gonna count it. I would say yeah. No, oh, I think it's fine. Yeah, seventy nine, eighty one, respectively. So okay. good job, Adam. <laughs> there you <laughs> go, Mad Max. That was. I heard it was a really good game. I didn't actually pick it up, but I heard it was neat and great and fun. So. So. I believe uh, words, gentlemen. I think it's about time to wrap it up for this day. So our closing segment, as per usual, we record on Tuesday nights while casting live and on Twitch at Mong Plays, where you should be right now, since we're casting live right now and chatting and chat and all that good stuff. You can email us at contact.mong at gmail.com, and you can find our Mong Twitter account, which is at mong.com. The dot is spelled out, and on YouTube at Mong Network. Um, you can find us on pretty much everywhere uh facebook tumblr instagram uh and our website of course which is middle gaming.com that's where everything goes up so if you want to follow our work definitely go over there and keep keep track over there and if you would like to be awesome and help us keep the lights on because having a website isn't free we do have a patreon account excuse me and you can find that by searching middle of nowhere gaming and if you can donate we very much appreciate it if not we still very much appreciate you watching listening and reading and all that good stuff so definitely don't feel like you have to and last but not least if you really enjoy these specific people on screen right now or making sweet sweet love to your ear holes i guess uh then you can follow us on twitter and my twitter is furious milk adam is Fanboy underscore Adam. And here he is. At Ill Grill Chill. There you go. So, again, those are our specific Twitter accounts. But yeah, if you like us, then hey, go follow there. And it's been a lovely time hanging out with you all. Hope you all have a great week. Gentlemen, outro time. Bye. Shoop to whoop. What the hell is happening? We had outros. We had a. I'm going to bed. Bye. I think I'm just-